Good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath and happy Thanksgiving to everyone. Thanksgiving weekend. Our call to worship can be found in the 146th division of the book of Psalms, which reads, Praise ye the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. While I live, will I praise the Lord? I will sing praises unto my God while I have any being. Put not your trust in princes, nor in the Son of Man, in whom there is no help. His breath goeth forth, he returneth to this earth. In that very day his thoughts perish. Happy is he who hath God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God, which made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that therein is, which keepeth truth forever, which executeth judgment for the oppressed, which giveth food to the hungry. The Lord loosened the prisoners. The Lord opened the eyes of the blind. The Lord raised them that are bowed down. The, do the Lord loveth the righteous. The Lord preserveth the strangers. He relieveth the fatherless and widow. By the way of the wicked, he turneth upside down. The Lord shall reign forever. Even thy God, O Zion, unto all generations, praise ye the Lord. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to say thank you today during this Thanksgiving weekend. Thank you, Lord, for waking us up. Thank you, Lord, for providing employment. Even though people are losing their jobs, you still are providing for us. Thank you, Lord, for keeping us in good health when people are dying from the COVID virus. Thank you, Lord, for all the many blessings that you have bestowed upon us and you have kept us in perfect peace. So right now, as we give you all the praise, honor, and glory for this worship service, may you come into this worship service. More importantly, may you come into our hearts. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Happy Sabbath, Mount Sinai. Once again, it's my joy and privilege to greet you and to extend welcome to our Sabbath worship. Let me hope that you're feeling blessed and not stressed and highly favored. If you're visiting with us for the first time, we welcome you all heartedly. And if you are a recurring visitor or a member, we say welcome, welcome, welcome. And now I'd like to turn to our usual milestones. I'm talking about our birthdays. And today we have one birthday celebrant. Special greetings going out this morning to our brother Fisher who celebrated a birthday this week. And so we say on behalf of the Mount Sinai Church family, may God continue to give you long, long life. May you continue to enjoy good health 
and wealth and all of God's blessings that he so freely lavishes on each and every one of us. And if there are others who are celebrating birthdays this week or anniversaries, I just want to say happy birthday or anniversary to you, our members and our friends. I want to take some time to talk to you briefly about remaining safe. As you are fully aware, the second bounce of the COVID-19 pandemic is upon us. And so I want to say to you this morning, it is extremely important that you keep safe. Keep safe for yourself and keep safe for your loved ones. If you don't have to leave your house or to go out in the public space, stay home. And if you have to go out in the public space, as many of us have to work or go to school, remember to wear a mask, especially if you're among a crowd or a group of persons. Wear a mask. Stay socially distance and ensure that you protect yourself and protect your loved ones because this COVID pandemic is no joke. Let me also use this opportunity to thank our members for their spirit of generosity, for their service and contributions to the food pantry and in serving the community. We also want to commend and thank you for your faithfulness in tithes and offerings, and also your contribution to the Brothers Keeper Fund and the Church Renovation Fund. I am sure that God is going to be blessing you. Also remember, that the doors of the church are still closed, but the church is pretty much open. The church is praying. The church is serving. The church is worshiping online and God is blessing his people. And so my friends, let us continue to love and to live and to labor and to serve our neighbors our friends and our community. And one of these days, all of this will be over. COVID will be of the past because our God is a way maker. Our God is alive and not dead. And so may God continue to bless us. Next Sabbath will be our youth day service. And we're inviting you to Come and join us online as we support our young people as they worship and as we all worship God in the beauty of holiness. God bless you. Enjoy the service and enjoy the Sabbath. It's offering time, church. And there's a saying that's so simple we teach it to kids in cradle roll, but so powerful that it's relevant for each of us. Jesus is here, the angels are here, and they are watching you and me. And so, as you're returning your tithes and your offerings, remember, do not be anxious saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? But seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you. So remember, Jesus is here, the angels are here and they are watching you and me.
boys and girls. Happy Sabbath once again. How are you? Awesome, awesome. Enjoying God's blessings? Yes, God is so good. Such a mighty, wonderful God that we serve. He's always doing good things for us. And we thank God for that. And so, boys and girls, today your story is about the wolf and the three sheep. And so, long time ago, boys, boys and girls in this, in this forest lived three brothers, three sheep. Their names were Shirley, Burley, and Curly. They stuck together, they loved each other, and they lived in a straw house um, in the forest. And so, boys and girls, sometime after, a mean, mean, mean wolf came and lived. A wicked wolf moved close to them. The boys were not happy because, you know what? The wolves would eat them because they were so small. And so the sheep huddled together, and this is what the big brother said. The wolf could attack us anytime. We need to be prepared. This house won't protect us. Yes, they decided to build their house. They built a big, beautiful, strong house that the wolf would not be able to enter. And so they get on, got on with their lives, boys and girls. And, and one day, the wicked wolf now decided that, okay, this is my time. I'm going to have those sheep for dinner. The boys, the, the sheep, <laughs> the sheep brothers, uh, Shirley, Burley, and Curly were inside their house. And boys and girls, the wolf came and knocked on the door, knocked on the door. Open the door, let me in. He bang, bang, bang. But the sheep were all comfortable inside because they knew that the wicked wolf would not be able to get inside. But the wolf now, he was so determined that he was going to have uh, the three uh, sheep for his dinner. Ha! Uh, won't you open the door? Then I'll huff and I will puff and I will blow your house in. And so he did not take it lightly. He said, okay, I'm going to outsmart them. What he did, boys and girls, he looked up and saw the chimney and he decided that he was going to go down the chimney. But the three brothers were smarter than that. In the meantime, they set up their fireplace because they knew that that wicked wolf would try to come through the chimney. They knew it beforehand. And so, boys and girls, they lit the fire right there at, 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 the, at the bottom of, of the chimney. And so, in the, in the meantime, the wolf walked up to the house and he climbed up to the chimney and he thought, oh great, I'm doing great, this is it. And he jumped over in the chimney and jumped all the way down. So boys and girls, he landed right on the fire. He was so frightened, that thing burned him so bad. He jumped up and he ran out of the house, ran out and left three sheep brothers, Shirley, Burley and Curly. They were so, so very happy. They were so very happy. And so the, the wicked wolf learned a big, big lesson. He was defeated. And so the moral of the story is, boys and girls, with careful planning, one can defeat even the strongest enemy. And with God's help, boys and girls, we can defeat the enemy. Do you know that Satan is the enemy? He's always a us always want bad things to happen to us but when we pray to God and ask for his protection and for his help God will protect us from our enemies and protect us from Satan the devil who constantly wants to destroy us so let us always pray to God pray to Jesus and thank him for protecting us and for caring for us at all times let us pray Oh God, our Father, Lord, thank you so much for your love towards us. Thank you, Father God, for protecting us from our enemy. Thank you for keeping us, Father God, from Satan who tries to destroy us. Father God, you are bigger and stronger and greater. So thank you, thank you for your love. Thank you for your many blessings. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Boys and girls, thank you, thank you, thank you once more for listening. Enjoy the rest of your Sabbath. And God loves you, and so do I. God's love is so wonderful, God's love is so wonderful, God's love is so wonderful, oh wonderful love, so high you can't get over it, so deep you can't get under it, so wide you can't get
of you, Lord, for your mercy never failed me, and all my days I've been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head. Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God And all my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able Oh, I will sing I love your voice It has led me through the fire And in darkest nights You were close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend Oh, I have lived in the good of God And all my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so so good With every breath that I am able Oh I will sing of the good of God Your goodness is running after It's running after me Your goodness is running after It's running after me With my life laid down I surrender now I give you
It is time for prayer, and today we can come together seeking God in prayer because He is our friend and He loves for us to come to call upon Him. Our kind and loving Father in heaven, we, your children, come bowing before you on this your holy Sabbath day to give you the praise, the honor, and the glory that is due to your high and holy name. We thank you, Father, for loving us with an everlasting love and for drawing us close to you. We thank you for Jesus Christ, for the sacrifice he made on Calvary's cross that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. We thank you for your sweet Holy Spirit that you have left to guide us into all truth. We thank you, God, that through the walking of your Holy Spirit in our lives, we can be renewed and you can take full control of our lives. Today, we come asking heaven's blessing upon our pastor. We pray, O oh God, that you would take him into your kind care and keeping. Speak to him, to speak to us through him. And Father, we will continue to give you all the praise, honor, and glory. We pray for your children listening to your voice today, for our friends, our visitors, our families, our co-workers, our church members. You have a word for every one of us. Those who are discouraged, Father, you can give them hope in time like these. They need a savior and they can trust in Jesus. For those who are hopeless, we pray that they will find comfort and hope through Jesus Christ, our Lord. For those who are homeless, that they will remember you have gone to prepare mansions for them in heaven. For those who are sick, Heavenly Father, we pray that you would go by their bedside. We pray that you would touch them from the crown of their head to the soles of their feet, and you will heal them according to thine divine will, and they will give you the praise, honor, and glory. Some of your children are going through trying times, but you encourage us in your word to fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. I will uphold thee with my righteous right hand. So, Father, no matter what your children are going through, whether they are lonely, they need not fear because you promise that you will never leave them nor forsake them. Father, we pray for our country today that you would be with the leaders, that they would turn to you, that they would seek your face, that you will heal this land and, oh God, your name will be glorified. We pray, oh God, in a very special way today for Sister Graham. We pray that you would pass by, give her the strength that she will endure and know that Jesus loved. And soon and very soon, we'll be in a place where there'll be no more sickness, sorrow, pain, or death. We pray for Elder Stott in a very special way that you would continue to bring comfort to him. And as he continued to look up to you, he would recognize that his help cometh from you. There are so many others who are sick, Heavenly Father, but we pray that you would give them that hope that would burn within their hearts to know that soon and very soon when Jesus comes, we will be in that land where there'll be no more sickness, no more sorrow, no more pain or death. Keep us true and faithful until this end, we pray, giving you the praise, the honor and glory with the forgiveness of every sin. In Jesus' name, with thanksgiving, amen.
Hear my cry, O oh Lord, attend unto my prayer. From the ends of the earth will I cry out to thee. So your people, we cry to you. Once again, it's my awesome delight. It's my pleasure. It's my privilege. It is with deep joy that I come to you this morning to bring you another message from the Word of God, especially in this season of Thanksgiving or at a time when the world is caught in the throes of the COVID pandemic or even more so at a time when we ourselves are challenged by our own vicissitudes, our own problems, our own sorrows, our own burdens. I dare say, my friends, that it's a good time to, to, to rejoice. It's a good time to praise the Lord. 
it's a good time to celebrate because even then God is good all the time and that God is good and God is great and that he's worthy of our praise. And so it is with this in mind that I direct your attention to a passage of scripture found in the book of Romans. Romans chapter 5. And I'd like to read in your hearing from verse 1 through to verse 5. Reading from the King James Version. That is Romans chapter 5. Reading from verse 1 through to verse 5. It reads as follows. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulation also, knowing that tribulations worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Bow your hands with me as we pray. And now, gracious Heavenly Father, as I stand before you, people, to open up your words, I pray, God, that you will open up their minds. And I pray, God, that you will speak through me only your words. I pray, God, that this sinful man will be uh, hidden and that Jesus Christ himself will be exalted. Jesus Christ himself will be seen. Jesus Christ himself will be known. Jesus Christ himself will be heard. And so, Lord, speak through me your word for these times. And may the hearts of your people rejoice through Jesus Christ, O Lord. Amen and amen. Once again, we find ourselves approaching another celebration or thanksgiving. Thanksgiving this year will be celebrated on November 26th. And it's usually celebrated with family and feasting, fun and frolicking, dining over the traditional turkey meal or a variety of dishes. And for the more religiously inclined, some kind of church or religious service. Historically, Thanksgiving celebrates the harvest of the fields and crops. Also outstanding achievements in life. And hopefully celebrating the blessings of God in the lives of his people. It's a time of celebration and thanksgiving. But with recent developments in our world during the course of this year, dark clouds seem to overshadow many lofty plans that usually characterize the festivities of the season. With the wearing of masks and the practicing of social distancing, the discouraging of large gatherings and the restricting of most major public events due to the recent spike in the cases of the virus across our cities and states. The prospect for large-scale celebrations have been whittled down, and the theme of rejoicing appears to be a misnomer, a contradiction, a loose term, or lost into insignificance when compared with previous years. Before the onset of COVID-19 or March 14, the world stage was prepared for economic growth and social infrastructural developments, private enterprises and partnerships, 
Make America great again. When the clock struck midnight on December 31, 2019, the world paused, as it were, to welcome the new year with fireworks, loud chairs, the sound of music, reveling and dancing. And for the somber, serious ones, the hours were approached with singing, church bells were ringing, prayer vigils were being conducted, and songs of salvations were being sung along with other religious rituals being practiced. I'm talking about celebrating hope in the glory and goodness of God. It was a new year full of expectations to overcome poverty or overcome bad habits or addictions or to defeat some terrible disease or turn around some terrible health prognostication or self-defeating tendency. And notice I said tendency because in every human being there is something in the human spirit that is ingrained, inborn, or stamped on our DNAs. And that is the ability to be resilient, to fight back, and to overcome. It's about hope and determination to overcome atrocities and adversities. For schoolers, this was the year to take full advantage of all the possibilities for good education, where the pedagogy, content, and delivery of education between teachers and pupils were meant to be friendly and effective. Or maybe for the unemployed, this might have been the year for job opportunities career choices, wealth creation, or the acquiring of a home, or perhaps for some others, the opportunity to give that struggling relationship or marriage another try or boost or kickstart. Hoping as it were for the best outcome in all affected areas. But as reality unfolded, this was not how things would turn out to be. For hope leading up to March 14 was soon to be dashed by the call for wide-scale lockdown due to the spreading of the deadly coronavirus. And some of those in authority took the warning seriously and acted quickly sensibly and responsibly and in the best interest of a nation, how different might have been the consequences today, especially for our nation. The last time I checked, at November 17, the death toll from COVID-19 across the U.S. stood at 247,000 and 11.3 million in total case infections. Worldwide, the death toll is estimated at 1.3 million and approximately 55 million people have been affected by the virus. And not to scare anybody, but as the winter approaches, the mounting fear is that the last wave might be worse than the first as hospitals across the nation and the world are bracing themselves for any eventuality. Perhaps our country, more than any other nation at this time, is precariously poised. Not to mention what is happening on the political scene with an incumbent sitting president refusing to concede after an election defeat, calling foul in a bid to overturn the will of the people and to hold on to power at any cost. I want to say, brothers and sisters, that these are unprecedented times in world history. 
And it is within this context or atmosphere that our worship, our praises, our thanksgiving, and our celebrations are juxtaposed. Indeed, we are standing in the shadows where horrific portraits from a strange backdrop keep staring at us, and we do not know when the slide changes what the next scene or set of portraits will be. One of the greatest themes of the Christian faith is hope. Let me repeat that. One of the greatest themes of the Christian faith is hope, triumphant hope, hope in the glory and the goodness of God. And I say, Amen. As I contemplate the meaning of the word hope, the dictionary reminds me that hope is the belief that something that is desired can be had, or it is the feeling that events, even though daunted by foreboding circumstances, may turn out to be right. And I say, Amen. In other words, my friends, we're talking about hope. Hope is not a distant or vague supposition, but rather it's a belief that things will turn out right because God is in charge of human destiny. And that in the midst of the struggles, in the midst of our sufferings, in the midst of the storms of life, the pains, the disappointments, we can fast forward our minds, our thought processes, our feelings beyond yesterday or yesteryears or even today to a brighter tomorrow. It's a kind of hope where all things will work together for good to them that love God because God indeed wins. I want to say to the church today that it was this glorified hope, this triumphant hope, this celebratory hope, hope over despair, hope over trials, hope over defeat, hope over evil, hope over sickness, hope over diseases and death, hope over disappointments that drove Paul to write these words, to the called, to the justified, to the saved, or even those who are sanctified or appointed to live through the crucibles of this present age. And so listen carefully to Brother Paul as he explains present truth to Roman Christians who somehow believed that suffering was a payback for sin or for some evil deed that someone had done, rather than an opportunity to rejoice and celebrate even in the midst of our pain, because deliverance is on its way. And so the text reads, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. The verse continues, And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also boast our glory in our sufferings, because we know that sufferings produce perseverance, and perseverance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put to shame, because God's love has been poured out in our hearts to the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. And I say amen for that. And so my brothers and sisters, for a few moments, help me examine Paul's worldview of the life of the justified, the life of the sanctified, the life of the Christian, the life of the child of God who hopes in the glory of God even amidst the evil and sufferings of this present age. And firstly, my friends, he tells us that the justified, 
the child of God, the Christian has peace with God. You didn't hear that. The first thing the text is telling us is that the justified, the righteous, the child of God, the sanctified, you and me, can have peace with God. Secondly, the justified, the righteous, the sanctified, the child of God, you and me, can have peace as well as access to grace, which comes through Jesus Christ our Lord. And thirdly, that God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. I want to shout hallelujah today. I want you to notice here, it, it is not only what the justified has. It is not only what the justified or the Christian has, but also who the, the justified or the Christian have. Now it's getting better already because the Christian has God. As a matter of fact, he has God the Father. He has Jesus Christ the Son. He has God the Holy Spirit who pours out the love of God in our hearts. And I'm getting all excited about this. What great combination of blessing can attend the justified? The child of God. The Christian in this world of, of tragedy. A world of trials. A world of tribulation a world of confusion, a world of mayhem, a world of sorrow. No wonder he continues to live like a lily that is planted in a swamp. Hmm. The child of God is like a lily planted in a swamp, and even though around it is messy and obnoxious, yet it remains fresh and lush and green. <laughs> Help me, Holy Ghost. And you ask, who is a justified person? Who is that Christian? Who is that child of God? I'm glad you ask. Paul says that the justified is that person who has been found guilty and stands condemned to die, but who confesses his or her sins, receives God's forgiveness. Then he or she stands squarely before God in the eyes of the accuser of the brethren, who is Satan, as though he or she has never sinned. Hallelujah. You didn't get that. I'm saying to you today, my friends, that the justified one, the holy one, the righteous one, the child of God is that person who has been found guilty. I want you to hear me carefully. He's not an innocent person. He's not a saint. He is found guilty and he stands condemned to die before God. But because he confesses his or her sins and receives that forgiveness, then that condemned person, that person who should have been condemned to death, he can stand before the accuser of the virgin who is Satan as though he has never sinned. Hallelujah. Glory to Jesus. I don't think you quite understand what I'm talking about here until you find yourself in a situation or in a place where you are guilty. You are subject to be condemned. You are subject to be sentenced because you have done some kind of wrong. I'm talking about someone who's waiting to be sentenced. And on that supposedly fateful day, while waiting to be sentenced or condemned, instead of hearing from the judge, take him away, take her away, the judge simply turns around and he looks at the lawyer, he looks at the prosecution or the prosecutor, he looks at the defense, he looks at the jury, and then he looks at the condemned person, the accused, and says, you are freed. Brothers and sisters, instead of being condemned to death, and because of Christ's righteousness, 
humanity now stands justified by God's grace. And so boasting is excluded. It's out of the question, Paul says. There's no need for boasting because a person is justified. A person is declared righteous by faith apart from works prescribed by law. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. But this is not how the story really ends. Because justification is not the religious equivalent of the fairy tale ending. They live uh, happily ever after. Oh no. I wanted to notice in the text where Paul declares in Romans 5 verse 3 and 4 he says, But not only so, listen carefully now, Paul is saying, For not only so, we are not just justified, we are not only just set free, but we also glory in our sufferings. Mm. We glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance and perseverance produces character and character produces hope and hope does not put to shame because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Preacher, what are you really talking about? I don't understand this. What is the meaning of this? What is really happening here? Well, the reality here is this. In the world where Christ has redeemed, the justified, the saint, the Christian, the child of God will come to realize that sin continues to raise its ugly head. Are you hearing the preacher today? I want to say that the reality is that in the world where the Christian has been redeemed, he or she will come to realize also that suffering remains so acute with each passing day. I want to say thirdly that in this world that Christ has redeemed, the child of God, the justified, the Christian will come to realize that life is a mixed bag of peace and hope, and suffering, and love. Hmm. But I want to say that in spite of that, Paul is at pains to say that with all of the suffering and all the problems, COVID-19, the, the poverty can't pay the bills. In spite of all that, Paul is saying that nothing, absolutely nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Huh. Have mercy, church. I hope I'm talking to somebody today. I wish I had some time to elaborate on what these themes, peace, hope, suffering, and love really mean to the justified. Let us look at peace. The Greek verb preceding the noun meaning peace is in the indicative mood and not merely the subjunctive mood. Now, it is therefore translated, we have peace and not let us have some peace. And we must therefore understand the difference between the two. We have peace as opposed to let us have some peace. You see, my brothers and sisters, peace is not some distant commodity to be received by placing an order or making some time of type of request while waiting for its arrival. Rather, peace, my friends, is a present reality. Peace is instantaneous. It's a possibility for those who have been made right or justified before God. And that is why my brothers and sisters, a child of God can lie on his or her bed, pain rocking your body. The doctor tells you that it's going to be your last. But with all of that, you can look up in the face of the doctor. 
You can look in the face of your, your, your relatives and you can smile because of the peace that God has poured out in your heart by the Holy Spirit. And so, my friends, we must understand peace is a present reality or possibility. It is made possible for those who are justified, only those who are justified before God. You see, brothers and sisters, justice and peace go together. Those who are just, those who are right, are at peace. And the gospel prophet Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 32, verse 17, reminds us that the effect of righteousness will be peace. Also in the Psalms, the psalmist reminds us that righteousness and peace exist together. And no wonder the justified or the righteous person, he has this beam, he has this confidence, he has this glow, this radiance. There's this tranquility in his soul exuding from his persona. This is called peace. And that is why in the midst of suffering, in the midst of pain, in the midst of grief, in the midst of, uh, of, of, of the storms of life, COVID-19, Black Lives Matters or the so-called political confusion at the center of our nations and all of what is happening in your life right now, the justified, the righteous, the child of God can fall asleep at the bottom of the boat like Jesus. Because Jesus is our peace. Jesus is the giver of peace. For he told his disciples, My peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. For not as the world giveth, give I you. For in this world you shall have tribulations. But have no fear, because I have overcome the world. I want to let you know that he's also our peacekeeper. For he's the master of ocean and earth and skies. For they all shall obey my will. Peace, peace, be still. But we must turn our attention to the second element. And that is hope. Not only do the justified or righteous has hope or peace, but he also has hope. And here Paul tells us in the text, and we boast, hmm, we boast, we exalt, we glorify in the hope of God. And so the word used here in the original or Greek for boast also means to rejoice. It means to exalt in or to excel in. And Paul's rhetoric now sounds different. Paul begins to boast or to exalt in this confidence and rejoices. Therefore, through Jesus Christ, we have peace with God, he says. Through Jesus Christ, we have peace with God. But not only do we have peace with God, but we also have access to the grace in which we stand. But wait a minute, wait a minute, church, there's more to come. For we, we, we have this hope of sharing in the coming of the Lord to take us from this world of sin. And then there'll be glory. There'll be glory. There'll be glory. There'll be glory. There'll be glory for me. Yes, sir. But we must face off with the third contender, our theme, and that is suffering. And so, my friends, in the text... We have come to realize that we boast or rejoice not only in the glory of God, the goodness of God, the greatness of God that speaks in nature, that speaks in human relationship, that speaks across the length and breadth of the world. We do not only boast in the glory of God, 
but the child of God, the Christian, yes, the Christian, he boasts in suffering. Recognizing the point being made in the text that our joys exist side by side with our sufferings. And be careful not to miss this point. The point here is not that the justified rejoices because he or she is suffering, but rather that he or she rejoices in the midst of suffering. And that's a difference. The message here is clear. Suffering does not produce or rejoicing or boasting. Rather, it simply cannot quash it or stop it. And the difference here, church, is based on the believer's understanding of suffering. You see, my friends, there's a Christian worldview of suffering. And there is the world's belief of what suffering is about. Number one, God's Spirit has been poured out into our hearts. You see, for first century Christians like Paul, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost meant that a new era was being ushered in. It was a time of change. And so even though there was suffering, even though there was pain and sickness and disease, it meant very little. In fact, all of this would have been temporary. The text says, it shall come to pass. I will pour my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions, and those who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And therefore we may rejoice in the midst of suffering, because we know that suffering is temporary. A new chapter has begun. And the future for which we hope is already changing the way we live. Hallelujah. That is why the Christian needs not fear or be discouraged because God's eyes are on the sparrows. He's watching over us. But there are still those who flirt with the idea that suffering is some kind of payback for sin. And if that were true, suffering people would have every right to wonder, what did I do wrong to de deserve this? And that's the same question that confronted Job's friends as they visited Job and they saw him in his situation. They could not understand. They did not understand what was happening. As far as they are concerned, Job was a hypocrite. He was right there in the face of everybody uh, pretending to be just, pretending to be right. But beneath, behind the scenes, behind the curtain, he was nothing more than an hypocrite, pretending to be what he is not. And so there they were, looking at him with bad eyes. Hmm. Well, God wants me to tell somebody. He wants me to tell somebody with the hearing of my voice today that those who are made righteous by Christ will suffer persecution. He also wants us to know, my friends, that suffering is not a sign of God's lack of favor towards us. Because God has no lack of favor towards us. Rather, my friends, God has shown what Catherine Cribb called in her book, God's outrageous generosity towards us. And Paul, therefore, in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, declares that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so, my friends, in the context of such grace, suffering only works to strengthen the resolve and the character of those enduring it. And I praise God for that. And finally, we come to the last theme, the theme of love. Now, Paul ends verse 5 on a theme of love. The first and only time the word love is used in the epistle to the Romans. 
And here we find all of heaven, my friends, is packaged in this one word called love. God the Father, Jesus Christ the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the entire Trinity, manifest love. For here, the love of God the Father is revealed to us. Then the love of Jesus Christ the Son acted out God's love for us. And also, the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead, pours out in and through us that same love of God towards us. And no wonder the, the words of the hymn writer says it best, O oh, love of God, how oh, strong and true, eternal and yet ever new, uncomprehended and unbought, beyond all knowledge and all thought. O oh, love of God, how oh, deep and great, far deeper than man's deepest hate, self-fed, self-kindled, like the light, changeless, eternal and infinite. O oh, we read the best in him who came to bear for us the cross of shame, sent from the Father from an eye, or life to live or death to die. But, O oh, love of God, or shield and stay, through all the perils of our way, eternal love in thee we rest, forever safe, forever blessed. And so, in summation, in the space of these five verses, we have found that the justified, the righteous, are the child of God. Even in the midst of pain, even in the midst of sorrows, even in the midst of suffering, and even in the face of imminent death, still glorifies, he still celebrates, he still worships. Because even the psalmist exalts, he says, God is our refuge and our strength a very present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, and though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, and though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof. For God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved, and God shall keep her, and that rightly early or right early because God is our peace he's our everlasting father and he's a prince of peace God is our hope for we boast in our hope of sharing his glory God is with us in our sufferings for we have an high priest who is touched by the feelings of all our infirmities yet he knew no sin Therefore we glory in our suffering, knowing that suffering worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope, and hope doth not put to shame. And finally, God is love, because his love has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And also, God is good. God is great. God is kind. God is faithful, God is friend, God is merciful. And so, God is good, God is great, God is kind, God is merciful, God is friend, God is merciful, God is full of compassion, God is Savior, God is Lord, He is the coming King of kings and Lord of lords. Yeah, God is coming back. And so my closing words to you today are to keep on believing for he's coming again. Keep on trusting for he's faithful who has promised. Keep on serving for eternal life will be your reward. Keep on celebrating even amidst earthly sorrows for your light affliction, which is but for a moment, work it far more exceeding an eternal weight of glory. My brothers and sisters, 
May these words cheer you on, buoy your spirits up, encourage your hearts. May these words lift us from the mere mundane to terrestrial places. May these words keep our feet firmly planted on the path of righteousness. May we remain committed to Jesus until he comes. It's my prayer for us in Jesus' name. And so, my friends, if it is your desire today to remain faithful to God amidst suffering, amidst pain, amidst hardship, if it is your desire today to remain steadfast to Him with all the allurements, the trials, if it is your desire today to keep on holding on to Him, I'm going to ask you to pray with me. Oh, gracious God, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, the God who is our peace, the God who is our hope, the God who is our righteousness, the God who is our glory. Today, God, we stand before you in a world of sorrow, in a world of perils, a world of transgressions, a world of pain, a world of afflictions, a world of sorrows. But God, we recognize that our light afflictions in this life are nothing to be compared to the joy that you have in store for us. And so this morning, I commit your people before you. As our faces differ, so our needs. I ask, O oh God, that your words will encourage our hearts, keep us focused, keep us committed, keep us determined, keep us faithful, keep us trusting, keep us loving, keep us serving, keep us surrendering, keep us baptizing. And at last, may we hear from your lips the words, well done. Thou good and faithful servants, enter into the joys of your Lord, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Desired of the Lord. One thing have I desired that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord to behold your beauty, to inquire in your temple in the secret of your presence. You shall. 